in just a few moments, but being that it is Monday, our resident foreign policy expert, Stephen Yates, uh, former former advisor to VP Dick Cheney, and he is with the D.C. International Advisory. Stephen, good afternoon to you. Happy Monday. Hi, Dan. Happy Monday. The uh, we, we talked last week about the Egyptian elections and how the Muslim Brotherhood has been sharing control with the military. And now we have the president, and this, of course, from Reuters this morning. He has invited Egypt's newly elected Islamist president, Mohamed Mursi, to the U.S. in September. My first thought, Stephen, about this, well, number one, I immediately thought of war on women because it's the Muslim Brotherhood, after all. Uh, is this – this seems as though because it's the Muslim Brotherhood that this is a highly questionable move, at least from my perspective, for the White House? Or is this something that they would be expected to do even though it's the party in question? No, it's definitely not expected. Uh, and it's not necessarily standard operating procedure that in any new democracy the newly elected leader is invited to the White, invited to White House, invited to Washington – or even sending the president to meet with them in their own country. I mean, really, uh, the White House is choosing this opportunity from a lot of others it could have. Uh, and so they must have a point they intend to make uh, in inviting this this particular leader. Uh, and uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand why they think it's good. Well, I, exactly. Uh, and, and even though I, I am curious, too, because it seems, at least in the Reuters article that I read, there wasn't any sort of discussion about having joined them a uh, any military leader, and we know that you know the military is kind of tempering, I would guess, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, this the president's move inviting this newly elected leader to D.C. This is going to be seen as giving this election and giving this party and their ideology, they believe in Sharia law, some legitimacy. Am I wrong? No, that's absolutely true, and I think that's. Uh, it's what's really tragic about this decision. Uh, really, the administration has tried to uh, give the impression that it's just respecting the democratic process and sort of their foreign policy is essentially we will send out a signal of what we think should happen, but let the chips fall where they may. Uh, but in this case, it really does matter where the chips have fallen, and the Egyptian political process still has a lot of sorting out to do. I mean, even today, there's a constitutional struggle between whether the legislature should sit or not. And this person that the, that, the, that the White House is inviting to the United States is involved in that tug of war, basically saying that the Supreme Court of Egypt, uh, the, the, this current leader, is saying that they want to defy the decision to keep the Islamists from sitting in the legislature right now. Uh, so the White House is putting itself in the middle of a tumultuous debate in a fragile emerging democracy, potentially, in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood. To what end, I can't concede. Right. Well, and they, and they say, well, we're just trying to influence uh, the policy direction in Egypt. That seems horribly naive to me, Stephen. <laughs> well, I mean, the president did make news early in his presidency going to Cairo and offering a speech. I mean, he doesn't. He has a lot of options besides inviting the Muslim Brotherhood elected president right. uh, to, to Washington. Now, they could meet Elsewhere, uh, President Obama could travel to the region if he really wanted to, and that way he could address a country rather than giving high profile to the leader only. Uh, he has other some has some distinguished surrogates he could send. I mean, for heaven's sake, he found a way to send former President Clinton uh, to go to North Korea to rescue Al Gore's journalist. He could send former President Clinton to go to take an early assessment of the situation there right. in Egypt. There are lots of choices. Why is the, why the eagerness then? Because, I mean, especially when you put it in, in those terms, it just seems as though he's very eager to recognize this as legitimate and let's we're going to be friends. And I, I just keep thinking it's the Muslim Brotherhood. This the, I, They believe in Sharia law. Even their leaders during the campaign had made mention of it. Uh, why, why would he be so eager to form this alliance? Well, I think that the way to analyze what the White House is, decisions are, whether it's foreign policy or domestic policy, really comes down to their political calculus in the election. They must determine, and we'll have to see whether they're right or wrong, whether bringing this kind of a controversy to Washington at that particular time will motivate their base or motivate our base, will make us look bad for criticizing him or make him look bad for having brought this tremendously controversial figure uh, to, our, to our part of the world at that sensitive time. 
Uh, I just think it's a bad move, but it's really up to us to really raise the voice, uh, get our members of Congress to get vocal and get active and talking about why this is wrong. Uh, and uh, really, this is another reason why foreign policy can't be a sort of a slumber party issue going through the, the fall campaign. Right. It really is going to matter what leader we have in the White House. Uh, and it's going to matter whether we have dead wood or real live beings in the Congress. Right. I I want to switch it up a little bit and ask you about this arms trade treaty. And I wish I could clone myself and give myself another three hours because it's something that I haven't been able to get to just yet. But it's still important. Um, How familiar are you with this United Nations arms trade treaty? And I'm looking at a report uh, as well that was uh, put out by CNS News that said that the uh, essentially the the deliberations on this are going to be overseen by Iran. What do you know of all of this? Well, number one, first thing you need to know, and maybe the only thing you need to know, is the two letters UN. Uh, mm-hmm. And if it involves the UN trying to regulate trade of any kind whatsoever, number one, it will not be effective. Number two, it's an effort to extort money from an accountable government. Uh, and number three, it had to do with arms. And I, I really wonder what arms we have had a hard time selling uh, that this will enable and what arms we have had a hard time stopping that this will help stop. Uh, So this usually is a a concerted effort for the world to regulate and tax American activities. And that's what I strongly suspect this is, and probably has to do with an extension of the Obama administration hatred for the Second Amendment here, trying to apply some of those principles internationally. Right. Think of the freedom fighters not being able to arm themselves. That leaves them only at the mercy of our intervention or the Uh, the benign intent of their oppressors. That's a very good point, too, because when I when I first read this, I thought that this um, just was completely limited to the scope of exports. But the more I read about it, the more I realized mm, maybe not so much. And it's it's funny when you consider funny in a very sad, horrible way, uh, when you consider that if they're looking at controlling arms that cross borders. Well, the biggest defender of this, of course, obviously, without question, is this administration with Fast and Furious. It's surprising ah. to me that it hasn't come up in you in discussion, Stephen. <laughs> Well, I think that they're just fellow travelers, so of course they're not going to come down hard on the on those who would seek to give them more money and more authority to regulate us. Right. Uh, but uh, it, but in truth, uh, it is actually another test of right. the the legitimacy and efficacy of this organization. We really there should be a new form of real estate on Turtle Bay in Manhattan. It should be turned into a resort, a casino, or something that would be profitable use of that land, rather than this kind of charade. Yes. Uh, trying to impose rule, rules and orders and then ignoring an obvious travesty right here. And they put Iran in charge of the discussions for it. Iran, of all of the countries. Right. These are people who who assassinate their citizens right in the street. Why, why we haven't just stormed out and, as you said, just completely turned these fools out. And, you know, we could have developed that because that, that's prime real estate. I've driven past the U.N. That is Absolutely. prime real estate and done something with it. I don't understand why we keep the charade going and why we spend so much of our own money towards the United Nations. It just doesn't, especially this is just one in the latest examples of offenses that they've committed towards us. But I don't get it, Steve, and I don't get why we're clinging to them. Well, it's mostly out of ideology and habit, and that the establishment is so strong. I mean, you really have to think back to Jesse Helms as the last senior statesman from the allegedly independent body of down Pennsylvania Avenue that really challenged what the U.N. was doing, whether they should be funded, whether they were dictating to us, or whether we were having our interests respected appropriate mm-hmm. to our level of contribution. Right. Uh, and we just have too few leaders willing to stand up and challenge uh, the organization. Personally, I think it has never solved a single problem. And people need to wake up because they're trying to regulate American activity, whether it has to do with arms, but even things like energy, development in the high seas, this Law of the Seas Treaty is an effort to try to take revenue from us and share it with everybody else. And so, I mean, they really have the spread the wealth around mentality and uh, and I just think that in these times, people ought to really wake up because they're getting more hungry for us. Right, right. Ugh. Well, Stephen Yates, I so appreciate your perspective every Monday on this. You can find Stephen at DC, dciadvisory.org. Stephen, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. We'll talk again soon. Your call.